Hello boys and girls and welcome back to Rock the Javia. I'm Daniel and in this video I'm going to talk about parallelism in the Zero library with fibers. So this video assumes zero experience with Zero, but otherwise that you're comfortable writing the Scala language. I'm going to describe everything that we need in this video. As always, I'm going to recommend that you write code with me in this video and whenever you need to refresh your memory about these parallelism and concurrency concepts in Zio, just refer back to the video or to the written form at the blog as usual with the link in the description. Alright, so without further ado, let's move to the code. So here I am in my IntelliJ project and I'm here to tell you that the code that I'm going to write in this video is compatible with both Scala 2 and Scala 3. Zio has versions for Scala 2.13 and Scala 3.0, I've tested them both. And in your build SBT project you should add dev Zio% Zio% and the version that I'm using in this video is 1.09. I'm pretty sure that the main APIs that we're going to use in this video are probably not going to change for a very long time. So rest assured. Let's get back to the code and let me talk to you about the effect pattern. So in pure functional programming we need to have the notion of the effect pattern and the main objective of functional programming libraries such as Zio or even cat's effect is to deal with expressions, that is computations, that might produce a value and produce an effect in the world. So a computation is a value plus an effect in the world. And we call these side effects. So you probably have heard about the term side effects, which is something that a program does in the world. For example, printing something in the console or sending something to a, through a socket or writing to a database or displaying something on screen. Those are example of effects. But in pure functional programming, we are concerned with the value that we produce. So in pure functional programming, we only work with values and we work with the so-called substitution model. And the substitution model is something that I'm probably going to talk about in another video in depth and also referential transparency and pure functional programming, but that's a subject for another video. The gist is that in pure functional programming, substitution model plus the side effects are quite incompatible because if you create some values, for example, let's call this a value, which is, let's say, I'm going to open a code block and I'm going to say print line, hello Scala, and I'm going to return the meaning of life 42. Now this is an example of an expression that also does something, so it prints something to the console and also returns a meaningful value that we can later compose in our functional programs. Now if I say, for example, if I define a method, let's say compute something or actually increment value, that takes an x as an integer and just returns x plus 1. So a very, very easy function that just increments a value. If I say increment value of a value, in pure functional programming, that is the same as increment value with the actual evaluation of this expression, which is 42. So increment value of 42 should be equal to increment value of a value. But even though this is technically true, because the value of a code block is the value of its last expression, the end result of this program in the world is not the same, because increment value 42 doesn't really print anything to the console, whereas this right-hand side does. So even though these two expressions are equal, they don't do the same things, and the substitution model that we so heavily rely on in functional programming starts to create a lot of headaches when we consider side effects. And so effect libraries such as Zio or Cat's Effect were introduced to create data structures that encapsulate this whole thing, the production of a value plus the production of an effect in the world. And that is called an IO monad. Now, we talk about monads in another video, why we need the concept of a monad, and IO is a very general term that denotes any computation that might produce a side effect. Now, this IO monad, in terms of the Zio library, is this Zio data structure. And Zio takes three type arguments. One is called R for the environment. One is called E, such that the computation might fail with an exception or with some error type, generic error type that we call E, and might produce a value of type A. So Zio has three generic type arguments, and we're going to consider this data structure throughout the entire video. Now, the simplest example of a computation that doesn't take any requirements, that's why it's called an R, any environment, cannot fail, so this exception type is nothing, and the A type might be a real value in Scala, would be something like Zmol, for Zio meaning of life, to say Zio, 
0.0.succeed. And I'm going to pass the value 42 inside. So 0.succeed is a computation that doesn't require anything. So the environment type is any. The exception type or the error type is nothing. And the desired value is of type int. So this will be a 0 of any, nothing, and int. Now, Zio operates with these three generic type arguments. Now, it's often the case that we use Zio with any and nothing as the first two types, and Zio has some useful type aliases to say UIO, that is a universal IO, so I'm going to import that. Now, UIO is just a type alias for Zio of any, nothing, and some desirable value type A. And as you see here, there are a bunch of type aliases in the Zio library. We're going to expand upon them in future videos or maybe in the Zio course that's due at some point. Okay. The goal of this video is to talk about concurrency. And for this video, I'm going to assume the daily routine of a person that I'm going to simply call Bob. So I'm going to simulate the daily routine of Bob. So here's me defining some zeros. I'm going to define some shower time. So let's say Bob takes a shower. So I'm going to create a zero with succeed. Let's say Bob taking a shower or simply me taking a shower because I'm Bob. All right, so taking a shower. I'm going to create a bunch more zeros here. So I'm going to say, Bell, let's call this boiling water because I'm boiling some water for my coffee. Not close to boiling, but almost. So let's say boiling some water. And I'm going to also create one to prepare some coffee. So prepare some coffee. All right, so I'm going to denote these as preparing coffee. Now, these three processes in real life are synchronous. So when I say I'm taking a shower, I start the shower and I don't come out until I've taken the shower. And same for boiling the water and preparing some coffee. So that's why I've created these zeros because the evaluation is completely synchronous. So let me create a method, let's call this synchronous routine. And this will be a for comprehension of zeros because these zeros follow the monad rules. So I'm going to run a for comprehension. The zero data structure has map, flat map, and also is able for for comprehension. So I'm going to say underscore in, let's say, shower time, and then underscore in uh, boiling water, and another underscore in preparing coffee. I'm going to yield unit because I don't really care about the result of this entire for comprehension. I might combine the values of these zeros, but in this particular case, I don't necessarily want to. And I simply want to print these items to the console so that we prove that this is a synchronous process. So I'm going to create a small method to decorate every zero with the capability of printing the value to the console and returning that same value inside. So I'm going to say def, let's call this print thread, as I'm going to return a string, an S interpolated string, and in between square brackets, I'm going to inject thread, current thread, get name. All right, so if I say shower time, for example, dot debug, and debug has a prefix which is called by name with a string, and this prefix will be printed to the console. So when you say debug, then you'll see this item printed to the console when it's evaluated, but I'm going to add the thread name. And I'm going to add this debug thing, and the prefix is print thread. All right, now because it's called by name, this print thread will be evaluated once the zero is being evaluated inside the thread pool of zero, as you'll see shortly. So I'm going to say debug with print thread and dot debug with print thread inside all of these. Now, in main, I'm going to evaluate this entire zero thing, and I'm going to do that by making my object here to extend zero.app. Zio.app is a particular kind of starting point which has a main method and instead exposes a main method that's more friendly for the Zio types. So I'm going to define the run method. So this is the main method in the Zio app and run takes an argument as a list of string and this returns a Zio instance. It's called URIO. It's again a type alias that takes a Z environment. It cannot fail and it succeeds with some exit code. So I'm going to simply return 
synchronous routine, and I'm going to say dot exit code. And at this moment, I should be able to run this application. So if I right click, I should have the option to run my application. And you'll see here, taking a shower, boiling some water and prepare some coffee, all of them in synchrony. So the order is well defined. If I say zero.succeed and each of these expressions has some sleep time or takes a bunch of time, then these zeros will be executed in sequence and the subsequent zero will wait for the previous one to finish before it gets evaluated. So taking a shower, boiling some water and preparing some coffee will always be printed in this order no matter how long it takes to evaluate them. So this is synchronous computation. All right, so this is synchronous processing in Zio. We want concurrency, and this is where we will introduce the fiber concept. Now, a fiber is a schedulable computation, much like a thread. So a fiber has the same semantic abstraction to a thread. However, for us, it's just a data structure. It's not mapped to a particular JVM or operating system thread. A fiber is a very lightweight data structure that can be spawned or created on the heap very, very easily. And it's up to the zero runtime or the zero thread pool to schedule these fibers for execution, resulting in some heavy parallelism. Now there are various implementations of fibers or of the fiber concept. We have fibers in Cat's Effect for which I'm going to link a video in the description if you want to check that one out and compare with this video. We also have fibers or the notion of virtual threads in Project Loom in the upcoming Java versions. So this is quite an important concept for parallelism. Now, in order to create a fiber, we need to know the data type for fibers in Zio. So a fiber has two type arguments. One is called E, which means that the fiber can fail with an exception or some error type E, and it can succeed with some value or desirable value type A. Okay, now let's create a fiber. So I'm going to define another routine here for Bob. And instead of having shower time and boiling water in synchrony, I'm going to say shower time happens in parallel to boiling water. So Bob will take a shower while the water is being boiled for coffee. So I'm going to define a method, let's call this concurrent bathroom or shower while boiling water. And I'm going to run again a for comprehension. And I'm going to say, for example, shower time dot debug with print thread. And in order to start this shower time zero or evaluate it on another thread or on another fiber rather, I'm going to use the fork method. So I'm going to say fork. And I'm going to also have the other bunch. So I'm going to say boiling water. And I'm going to say debug print thread. And I'm also going to have preparing coffee dot debug print thread. And I'm going to yield unit because I don't really care about combining the values of these zeros. And instead of synchronous routine here, I'm going to call this other method and I'm going to run my application now. All right, so we have here boiling some water, taking a shower and prepare some coffee. Now notice that taking a shower is executed in another order with respect to boiling some water. So taking a shower is run on another thread. Notice the thread name zero default async two with respect to the other thread name. So this is how you can evaluate a zero on another thread by calling the fork method and this will start a fiber. Now, this is one nice thing that we can start or evaluate zeros on another JVM thread or rather on another fiber scheduled by the zero runtime. But we also need to synchronize our threads or our fibers so that our computations actually make sense because we need to have Bob having taken a shower and having boiled the water before Bob can prepare a coffee. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create another method. I'm going to call this concurrent routine. And I'm going to run again a for comprehension. And I'm going to start the shower time and boiling water on two different fibers. So I'm going to say the shower time debug print thread. And I'm going to say fork. I'm going to do the same thing for boiling water. So debug print thread and fork. So right now I have two fibers here. I can 
execute them in whatever order I like. Now, if I want to synchronize them, I'm going to call the zip method between these two zeros. Now, the trouble is that fork is an effectful operation, and effectful means that besides the value that the entire zero will return, we also have a side effect, a potential side effect, that the shower time will be scheduled on some fiber scheduled by the zero runtime. So I'm going to evaluate this on another zero that I'm going to call, let's call this shower fiber. And I'm also going to name this boiling water fiber. And these two I'm going to zip together. So I'm going to say zipped fiber as shower fiber zip with boiling water fiber. And these two are currently unknown. But I'm going to make the compiler aware of that by saying yield unit here. So we now have type inference by the compiler. The shower fiber is fiber runtime. So this will be a type alias for another zeo of fiber and a bunch of other type arguments. So this you can also consider this as a zeo data structure, which you can zip with some other fiber. So this will be a fiber that will fail with a throwable and it will succeed with a tuple. And I'm going to have for example result in zipped fiber. And on this zipped fiber, I'm going to call the join method. Now join is a particular method on Zio's returning fibers that will wait for both these fibers to complete before we can continue. So join will simply block the current fiber until this zipped fiber has been fully evaluated. I'm also going to call debug with print thread so that we don't miss that. And I'm going to have something that depends on this result. So I'm going to say zio.succeed. And I'm going to inject the result here. So I'm going to inject result done. And then I'm going to say debug print thread so that we can see on which thread this was evaluated. And then I'm going to sequence that. So I'm going to say star greater than this is a sequential operator. So and then you can name this and then if you'd like, I'm going to say preparing coffee dot debug and I'm going to say print thread. So I'm going to basically start these two zeros on different fibers. I'm going to zip them together. I'm going to wait for both of them to finish. After they're finished, I'm going to print this result to the console and then I'm going to start preparing the coffee. So this is the concurrent routine. Bob is taking a shower while the water is boiling and after both of them are done, I'm going to say result done and then I'm going to start preparing the coffee. All right, let's try running this on main. Let's see how this works. And we have here taking a shower, boiling some water. Notice that they run on two different threads. And now we have taking a shower, boiling some water. And this is the zipper fiber join debug print thread. So this is the result of these two fibers. Notice that the zipping was evaluated on another JVM thread. And then we have the result done, which is still on a 6 And then we have the final statement here, prepare some coffee. So this is basically the fork join mechanism here in pure functional programming with Zio here in the first four lines of this fork comprehension. And then we can do whatever we want after that join has been successful. Now, I'm going to talk about interruptions now. Let's say that Bob, while he's boiling his water, he receives a phone call from Alice to invite him to have a coffee together. And if Bob receives this phone call, and obviously if Bob wants to go out with Alice and have a coffee, then there's no point in boiling the water in his home. Just stop the boiling water and then go with Alice to have a coffee there. So here's the thing. I'm going to define a simple zeal. I'm going to say call from Alice as zeo.succeed and I'm going to have a simple string call from Alice. This is something that the phone might report or Alexa or what have you in your home. Now I'm going to enhance this boiling water thing to take a little bit of time. So I'm going to say, let's say boiling water with time and I'm going to say boiling water debug print thread and then so I'm going to use this star and operator this star greater than and then I'm going to say zeo.sleep and zeo.sleep requires a particular import I can say five dot seconds 
but this is not the standard Scala package for Scala duration. You will need zero duration. So I'm going to go ahead and say import zero duration everything, which contains the extension methods for int. So we have zero sleep with five seconds. And then I'm going to say zero.succeed. And then I'm going to say boiled water ready. Okay, so we have a little process here for boiling our water, which takes five seconds. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to define another method. Let's say concurrent routine with Alice call or something like that. I'm going to run a for comprehension. And this time I will not start my shower and start boiling the water at the same time. I'm going to assume that you understood the join mechanism here. I'm simply going to start the shower synchronously. So I'm going to say shower time debug print thread. Then I'm going to say boiling fiber in and I'm going to start this boiling water with time thing, this little process here on a separate thread so that I show you how we can interrupt the evaluation of a zero. So I'm going to say boiling water with time dot fork. So fork returns a zero containing a fiber and this will be a fiber. And I'm going to say underscore in Alice or call from Alice dot debug with print thread. And this I'm going to call fork. So I'm going to evaluate this on another thread. And then I'm going to interrupt this fiber. So after I've received the call from Alice, I'm going to interrupt the fiber that started this little process for boiling my coffee. So I'm going to say boiling fiber dot interrupt. Now this interrupt method is not really known to the compiler until I write a yield statement here. So let me add that. So yield unit. And notice that right now I have interrupt here on this boiling fiber because it's a fiber instance. And interrupt returns a zero again because it's an effectful operation. So it should return a zero data structure. And then I'm going to debug with print thread so that we see which thread this executed on. And finally, I'm going to make Bob accept the offer from Alice. So I'm going to say zero.succeed. And I'm going to say screw coffee, screw my coffee going with Alice. And finally, I'm going to also debug with print thread. Okay, now let's use this in main and let's see what happens. So I'm going to run this in main, rerun my application, and we'll see some interesting thing here. So we have taken a shower, boiling some water, and then at the same time, we have a call from Alice and then we have on async5, the thread that was evaluating this boiling fiber thing, we have a failure with a very, 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 very long explanation here for why this fiber failed because it was interrupted by some other thread. And finally, I'm going to say zero succeed with screw my coffee and going with Alice. So this is how you can interrupt another fiber while it's being executed. If you want to make this more realistic, you can also inject another zero sleep here. So I'm going to say another zero sleep, for example, with two seconds. So while the water was boiling for the coffee, we receive a call from Alice. Then I turn off my boiling water and I go with Alice to have a coffee. So we have taken a shower, boiling some water, call from Alice, and then we have a failure which denoted the interrupted fiber. And then we have screw my coffee going with Alice. Now, you might think that interrupting a fiber is an expensive operation, and you would be right if you were talking about JVM threads. JVM threads are heavyweight data structure, and they're extremely expensive to start and stop, but interrupting or removing a fiber from scheduling, this is really, really cheap, and Zio can spawn literally millions of fibers and schedule them on a relatively small thread pool without any hassle at all. Now, the last thing that I'm going to show you in this video is how you can make your Zio execution or evaluation uninterruptible regardless of whether you started them on the main thread or forked via some other fiber. So let's assume on Bob's morning routine that he successfully took the shower and he successfully boiled the water and he just started preparing the coffee when he receives that phone call from Alice to grab a coffee. So if you're preparing coffee and you're just receiving a phone call from a friend, to grab a coffee somewhere else, you decline and say, hey, I just had my own coffee. Maybe you want to come over and have coffee here in my place. So I'm going to define a method called, that's called concurrent routine with coffee at home. And I'm going to run a for comprehension 
And I'm going to say, for example, shower time. So I'm going to run this synchronously. So debug with print thread. I'm going to have another generator here for preparing coffee, actually boiling the water. And I'm going to start a fiber, which takes a bunch of seconds to actually prepare my coffee. So I'm going to say val prepare coffee with time. And I'm going to say prepare preparing coffee debug print thread. Then I'm going to sequence with zero sleep with five seconds. Seconds. And then I'm going to say zero dot succeed. And I'm going to say coffee ready. All right, so I've just created another zeo with a little process over here. Cool. So I'm going to start a coffee fiber. And I'm going to say prepare coffee with time and I'm going to fork that. So I'm going to say prepare, prepare coffee with time, debug print thread, so that we can see which thread this executes on. And then I'm going to fork that on another fiber. And then I'm going to add a modifier here to say uninterruptible. So uninterruptible is a little method that just ignores uh, interrupt signals from some other fibers. So I'm going to say, for example, result in call from Alice. And I'm going to say debug with print thread. And I'm going to say fork. So I'm going to receive a call from Alice from a different fiber. And then I'm going to sequence that with my attempt to interrupt the coffee fiber to see what happens. So I'm going to say coffee fiber dot interrupt. So I'm going to say interrupt as it is. Coffee fiber is a fiber because the compiler type inference has not kicked in yet until I write my yield thing. And I put the right symbol here. So we have coffee fiber interrupt and I'm going to debug with print thread in case I'm interested in that. And then I'm going to run a small pattern match to see if this result was successful or not. So this result thing is of type exit with a particular error type and the desired value of uh, type string. Now here I'm going to say underscore in result match. And in case, let me run my parentheses, and in case I get exit, which I'm going to import from zeo exit.success with a value, then I'm going to return a zeo.succeed. Let's say, sorry Alice, making breakfast at home or something. And then I'm going to again debug print thread. And in case I get whatever else, I'm going to say zeo.succeed. And I'm going to say going to a cafe with Alice because I was successfully interrupted from making my coffee. Never going to happen. Okay, so debug with print thread. All right. Now, let's run this particular method here in main, and let's see what happens. So I'm going to run my application, and then we're going to interpret our output. All right, so we have taken a shower, boiling some water, prepare some coffee, call from Alice, and notice that nothing happened for five seconds until I have coffee ready. And the end result was success with coffee ready. And if we have a success with some value, which I don't happen to be using here, simply going to return sorry Alice making breakfast at home. So this is how you can simply ignore interrupt signals from another fiber. All right, so in this video, you learned the basics of the effect pattern and how the Zeo library works with effects. You also learned how we can run synchronous and asynchronous computations and how we can wait, how we can interrupt and how we can ignore interruptions to create meaningful, purely functional programs that we like. I hope you liked this video. If you did, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Check me out on Twitter and LinkedIn. I post fresh updates on upcoming material and check me out on the site at rock.jvm.com. I have tons of content in courses on Scala and purely functional programming and interview preparation in CATS and Zeo and Aka and Apache Spark and so much more. Until the next video, I'm Daniel signing off.